So our next speaker is uh, Kat Passon, who hails from Cleveland, Ohio, um, which you might remember as the place where PyCon happened this year and will be happening in next year. I suggest you might want to make arrangements to go do that. It's a fun event. And uh, in Cleveland, uh, he has worked as a Python developer, um, mainly on web, and has now transitioned into uh, focusing on accessibility and web front ends. And that is what he's here to talk about today. Please make him feel welcome. Thank you, good morning. Thanks for being here. So um, the backstory to this talk is that I've been doing accessibility development now for about three years. And last summer, I was speaking to the PyOhio organizers, and they had mentioned to me they were looking to revamp their website. And part of that was that they wanted to make it more accessible and asked if I would be interested in taking the time to help them out, do an assessment, and help with any of the work needed. So. I, of course, said yes, and this talk is my story of how we did that. So first, some caveats. Um, this is not an intro talk. I am not going to talk this morning about what is accessibility, why is that important, discuss what the WCAG requirements are. I am assuming that you have either maybe seen or watched a talk like that before, or that you have at least vaguely heard of what accessibility is, and if you haven't, that's okay. But what I'm going to do is jump right into here are some examples of problems and how we can identify them as problems and go about fixing them. This is also not a complex site. This is a static site. It's not a big enterprise site. It doesn't have complex interactions. So you probably can take away a lot of what is happening here today. You might not be able to use all of it in the things that you want to put that in, and that's okay. You just may have to do some more research on your own. Um, I'm also assuming that you are at least vaguely familiar with what HTML looks like and how it works. Uh, if you aren't, that's OK, too, but you may be a little bit lost. This is mostly meant to make you feel better about if you are asked to look at a site for accessibility or if you know somebody who is, that you can then support them and make them feel better throughout their journey. So identifying. This is the 2017 PyOhio site. It's, uh, it's pretty plain looking, actually. And there's some things that are a little bit off if you know what to look for, such as uh, it's not too easy to tell where the links are. But um, this is what we used as the base when I first started looking at things and did an assessment. And the first thing that we did to make our lives easier is that we dropped the code base. <laughs> And I know that not everybody can do this, and I'm sorry, but I definitely advocate this as a way of doing things for a small project or a personal site, because then you get a fresh start for free. You don't start working in any of the assumptions you already had with the previous code base or any of the base that may be flawed. You can try new things, you can experiment, and that makes it a lot easier. Um, what this helped us out with, actually, was the, the internals for submitting a speaker profile, submitting a talk proposal, submitting a tutorial proposal, those were all really, really gnarly in the 2017 site. Um, in fact, the nastiest part was that there was a rich text editor in there at some point, and if you have ever seen how those work, trying to make one accessible is kind of a nightmare. And now instead, we just have plain text with markdown, so that's really nice. And I wanted to take the time to thank the North Bay Python folks for letting us fork their site so that we could have a site this year because I don't think that we would have been able to make it in time if we didn't, so thank you again. Sorry. <laughs> it wasn't that bad, come on. <laughs> so I'm going to start by showing you some quick and easy ways to identify some problems in your site um, using Wave, Axe, and Lighthouse. So. This is the site for this year from before I made some changes to it to make it more accessible. Uh, you can see it's very, very similar to the North Bay Python site. This is a local that I've got running. It's on this very specific commit. And this is what Wave looks like. Let me see if I can zoom that in. So what I like about Wave is that it shows you in the page by injecting some markup what it thinks might be issues, and it'll scroll to that element down here. And so you can see, like, this one, it says it thinks might be a heading because the font size is humongous on this paragraph tag, as an example. 
So it shows you a summary on the side, errors, alerts. It'll show you your structure and some nice things you may have added. It also shows you contrast errors. So you can get a more detailed loadout. You can get some information about what does this mean? Why is this important? And we don't have any contrast errors here, but what I want to show you is that this, there's this really neat color picker in here, and if you selected an element that it showed as an error, it'll fill in those values automatically. And you can play with this in real time to see if your colors pass or don't pass. And that's really nice, because now you don't have to go out to something like Photoshop to double check, and that's really cool. The only downside to Wave is that it injects a bunch of stuff into the page, so you have to re reload the page when you turn it off which kind of sucks if you're doing something that you had to like post to get to, because then it might break. So let's talk about Axe. Let me zoom that in a bit, too. Come on. So Axe is very similar to Wave. Um, it seems to be cut off because I zoomed in, which kind of sucks. It categorizes its stuff a little bit differently. There's violations, needs review, rejected, and best practices. Um, there's not a lot that it finds wrong with this page on just to start with, because there isn't a whole lot that is wrong with the home page. It's just a whole lot of plain text. It also has the ability to highlight a node in the page, so it'll put a border around it, but um, all of these are on the main HTML tag, so there's nothing to see. So that's cool, and it lives in your dev tools. You don't run it the same way that you would uh, wave. And then there's also Lighthouse, which I really enjoy. Um, this is baked into Chrome. It's under the Audits tab. My favorite part about Lighthouse is you can use it to emulate mobile, and it also will throttle your CPU to fake a 3G connection, which is really great if you don't have something like conference Wi-Fi to make it slow for you. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. We all know that it's not great. So, you can check more than just accessibility here. You can see that you can check things like your progressive web apps if you have one of those and see how good you're doing. There's best practices, there's SEO. Those are all really fun. I only care about accessibility today, so I'm going to run this real quick. And it emulates a Nexus 5X and then says, hey, look, uh, we got in 100. I don't believe that. So it'll give you what you passed, which we passed nine audits. That's neat. If there were failures, it would show those two. Here's 26 that don't apply to this page. And we've got 11 things that we need to check manually. And I will come back to those in a little bit. Let's look at something more complicated. Here's the speaker profile page. So this is all plain text, some markdown spots. Um, it's very similar to what you may have submitted if you submitted to North Bay Python. Um, and if we run Lighthouse again, this time in desktop mode because I don't need a mobile experience, it is still going to tell me that nothing is wrong with this page. There are things wrong with this page. And I will get into those in a moment. But what is important to note here is that all of these things for Lighthouse that it gives you, there's little learn more links, and all of these go out to stuff like Google Developers and DeQ and other resources that tell you, hey, this is what this is, and how do you do that? And that's a really neat feature of that. I keep talking about how like this isn't legit and you know we we don't get everything out of this and that is because we can only catch about a third up to a third of the potential accessibility issues on a site using automation. It's closer to a quarter if you have even more of the success criteria that apply to you and that's because there's so many things that are subjective that the tools cannot guess for you. It can tell you that your image does in fact have an alt attribute that is filled in and not empty, but it cannot tell you if that is actual good alt text, or if your labels are good and meaningful, or if your captions are accurate. So automation is handy. You can, you can rely on it to help you out, but you cannot rely on it to entirely save you. So next we want to verify things. And what I'm going to go back to now is the Lighthouse stuff that I showed you with these items to manually check. So the ones that are the easiest here, which hopefully you can see in the back, but I will read them out if you can't. The page has a logical tab order. Interactive controls are keyboard focusable. User focus is not accidentally trapped in a region. And visual order on the page follows DOM order. 
All of these are things that you can test with a keyboard, and because this page is generated by a Django model, we get all of that for free as long as you use the right model. All of it will generate the correct markup for a given type, and then you don't even have to worry about this because it's already there for you. This is, so I mentioned this is technically correct, but it's not completely correct, and I'm going to attempt to show you why. Oh, well, you're not where I wanted you to be. This is voiceover. Voiceover, um, it's, it's not gonna work entirely right on Chrome. You should really do this with Safari, but I didn't want to multi-wheeled browsers because I have enough screens open already for this presentation. So what VoiceOver is going to show us here is that I have focused the name field. It reads out that it's required and it's invalidated by default because of the HTML5 required and that it's edit text. It didn't say anything about the subtext underneath name as you would like it to appear in the conference program. This is not hooked up correctly. It's not tied together so that you can hear that out if you can't see it. So another example of how this isn't working right. I'm going to make this have an error. Because this is the easiest form to do that with. So I just got dumped back on this page. And I don't know why if I can't see. If I tab back to this, it still says that it is required and invalid, but it doesn't tell me what the error message actually is. Now imagine that this wasn't something as simple as I left a field blank. Maybe this is I was trying to purchase something online and my expiration date is invalid because I picked the wrong year and I picked a date in the past. Maybe I put something in a field that was too long or I did something else wrong and there was a more detailed error message to show here this wouldn't be read out, and if somebody could not see that and associate that with that form, they have no idea what happened, and they will probably bail on your site. So this is a huge problem. Uh, we don't get this for free, and we need to hook these all together. And that isn't necessarily something I'm going to tell you how to do today, because that's rather involved. Thank you, voiceover. But that covered our first two kinds of testing. Keyboard testing and screen reader testing are the most important. You will catch as the bulk of the issues that you have by doing this. Keyboard testing is extremely simple. Just don't use your mouse. Can you see where you are on the page? Can you interact with everything on the page? And screen reader testing is a little bit more complicated until you get used to it. Really, all you need to do is verify, do I hear the same things that I see? Do I have all the context without having to travel around the page to make sure that I understand what's happening? It works best if you turn off your monitor to kind of emulate the experience, and that's not perfect, but it will help enforce that you need to have as much information on hand in as few places as possible. Some other things that we can do are browser zoom and touch devices. So the one WCAG guideline that I have memorized because I need to bring it out as a bludgeon so often is that your web page must be able to zoom up to 400% without having multiple directions of scrolling. And when you do that, the viewport that you wind up getting is about the same size as my iPhone SE. That's pretty small. But what this does is that it can help you test out that your website is actually responsive and that you can actually use all of it without having to be on a mobile device. If you're only doing this by like checking a user agent and serving a very specific experience, if you can find like iPhone or iPad or Android, then you're going to break the experience for a lot of people. Also, just using a touch device in general, uh, have you ever tried to use a website, maybe tried to purchase something online, and you tried to click in some spots to do some things, and the tap didn't actually work in the spot that it was supposed to, and you had to tap around to try and get it to work? So if you turn on your mobile screen reader, VoiceOver on iOS or TalkBack on Android, you can use your finger and slide it around the screen, and the cursor outline that you get will show you where it believes the tap target is for a particular element, and you can see if things are positioned wrong and overlapping things that they shouldn't be. So not only is this a great way of just testing out that your site is actually workable on mobile, but you can then use that to double check that you get the same results in terms of what am I hearing that you went on desktop. So this is not all-encompassing. Um, this site is still really small. I've showed you two pages out of like 
maybe 15 or 20 total, and this was about a day or two days of work to do an assessment. When I have to do this for my day job, when I'm asked to help coordinate an assessment, um, bringing out all of the devices that I can find and using every screen reader that I can get my hands on and putting together a group of people to help me out. It takes me about five to seven days to go through the stuff that I have to go through at work because it's a more complicated enterprise application, there's more flows to it, there's more states, and that's just to look for every little discrepancy that I can and make sure that everything is working in a way that makes sense and that's also with the caveat that I know what I'm doing. And when you are first starting out with this, it is going to seem like you're never going to get done and it's going to take a long time. And I've been there and it's okay to feel that way. You shouldn't worry about the fact that this looks like it's going to take a long time and you're not gonna know what you're doing because that's how this is for everyone when they first start out with this. It's okay to have that feeling, but what we're gonna do next is we're gonna talk about making a plan so that you can feel better about what you have to wind up doing. So perhaps you have death by a thousand cuts. Maybe you have a ton of contrast errors. Maybe you have a ton of simple form errors. Maybe you have a whole bunch of heading structure issues. Organizing and going page by page or flow by flow will make this a lot easier for you to figure out what order you need to do things in and help yourself stay accountable. If you have maybe larger changes, like you have to touch something that is a little more critical or a little more complex, there's no shame in feature branching that. It has saved a lot of our lives at work when we made a branch and just left it hanging out for a while as we made updates to it and made sure that everything was stable on our end. And then like slowly merge, develop back in, retest, and make sure that everything was fine before we sent it back, just to make sure that we didn't shatter the universe for everyone else. And your, the rest of your developers in your QA will thank you if you do it this way. And you can use these to then set some goals for each release. Maybe if you use burn down charts, you can go for a percentage or numeric value of your defects closed so that you can prove over time, hey, we're getting better at this. We're slowly getting more and more things done and to show that you're not regressing at all. And you can also use that to do things like, now that we have completed this bespoke flow over here, we don't wanna regress anything on that. We don't want to see any more things pop up with that. As you add new things, maybe you can say, I want to learn at least one new thing that I can pull back and then use that in other places on the site as improvements as I go back and incrementally change things. So in terms of the PyOhio site, Normally what I like to do is go template by template and do all of my work in the HTML because it winds up being a lot simpler in the end and then you don't have to bolt things on nearly as badly. But I was not able to do that in this case because this template, sitebase one columnhtml happens to be the base for uh, pretty much almost every page on the site. And the black body line that I have highlighted is just dumping all of the Django content into the page. So there's no way to make changes in the template for an individual page because this serviced so many pages, and this means that you have to bolt all of your changes on in JavaScript, which can wind up looking something like this. And there's no shame in this, but this is going to show you that you may have to go back and do some rework and that you may need to rethink how you are doing things. So this is admittedly disorganized. This is not necessarily the most professional output that I have had in my life, but this is the breakdown of each of the different things that we had to do for each of the different forms on the site. And some of them were extremely simple, like this home alert. When you sign up, you are redirected to the home page, and there's a banner that pops up on the home page that says, thank you for signing up, please go check your email. And without adding a role of alert to that banner to specify that an assistive technology needs to pick up that something happened here, you wouldn't know unless you reread the page manually that something changed and you would be like, why am I on the home page? What's happening here? So some things are extremely simple like this. Other things got incredibly out of control and I'm not gonna linger too long in the code for this because I just wanna highlight the comment here that I'll read out because it's probably hard to see in the back. This form is complicated. It can have a global error. It can have an inline error. The global error does not necessarily directly tie back to a single input, and the user potentially has to error twice to hear both of them. 
This was for the sign-up form for the site, just to register an account. So it wasn't that the form is long and complicated. It was just your email and your password. And when you get to something like this, where you have multiple different code paths just for a single function, just to make sure that things are going OK, this can be a sign that you need to take this back for review. Like, you may have to bolt stuff on still to make it work in the meantime, but this is a sign that you need to go back and say, hey, I don't think that we did this the right way. We need to reconsider the way that we did this. Can we talk about this later? So the speaker profile form and the talk submission form and the tutorial submission form were all the same. And so they got their own function. And this is a lot, but it's also extremely simple. Just every help text that was there, all of those little subtexts under the forms, we grab those, we stick them to the input that it looks like they go with. If there was an error, we do the same thing. And that's what most of these things look like, and you may be able to roll these out into their own separate condensed functions that you can reuse from multiple places on your site, which will help you a lot. So due diligence, now that we've done all these things, how do we keep from sliding backwards? You can keep fixing and you can keep testing, but those are expensive. Like, that's developer time, that's QA time. Nobody wants to keep going over and retrofitting the same stuff over and over. So how do we deal with future-proofing? I'm going to attempt to live demo Pali. I believe that's how it's pronounced, but I might be mistaken. It's a numeronym. I don't know. Things are strange. Hopefully, you can see the text that's there. I don't expect you to actually read what the path to my command line is, because I put the colors for a dark background, and that's not normally the colors I use. So um, what I'm going to try to do is demonstrate how the CI version works. And you can use this to give you a way of showing that a build has broken. So what it does by default It takes a list of URLs, and you put this in a dot file, and you can assign actions as well so that you can get behind authentication, but that's a little much for today. But when you run Pali in the CI mode, it uses a file like this, and it will run and hit every single one of those URLs and evaluate them. So I believe in you, Internet. So up at the top, you can see maybe in the green that there's no errors on some of those pages. But I deliberately put in a page that I knew was bad that isn't actually in use on the live site. It was for a, uh, it's locked out behind some Django admin stuff right now in the local that I have. But it will show you things like, hey, you're using a placeholder instead of a label. You aren't using a label at all. This button doesn't have some attributes that it should. And you can then use this data to send it back and say, hey, your build is broken. Here's the report. And you can see exactly where things are busted on particular pages. And that's really handy. But what you can also do, and here's where I hope the internet really holds out, is pass in a sitemap. And the PyOhio site does not have a sitemap because we are not using, I can't spell. Um, we aren't using that Django plugin. So I'm going to cheat and use my own personal site because I have a sitemap there. Crap. OK, I need to stop turning around and actually type this correctly. So I apologize for the line wrapping over itself, but um, when you have a dot file config in place, it's going to try to use that first and then take whatever sitemap you pass it. And so I'm giving it a config that has no URLs in it so that it only looks at my site. And this will crawl every URL in the sitemap. So we should get similar output. So yeah, I have some SVG errors, and that's fine. I knew about those. But you can use, <laughs> I've left them there for a while because I'm lazy. I'm a bad person. 
Um, you can still use this to say, okay, well, I just need to quickly crawl a single site, and if you publish a sitemap, because most people do, then you can just point it at that and say, okay, now I just need a quick report of what looks wrong from the automation, and that way you don't have to maintain a dot file with a whole bunch of URLs if you have nothing that you need special actions for. Um, the URLs listing would be great combined with some actions that say, here's how you log in with a test account that's meant for this. Here's some things that you need to click on to change the page state so you can reevaluate it. Like if you have maybe some drop downs or a menu or interesting things like that. Um, those are good ways to change the output of that, but that's above and beyond the scope of what I'm willing to do in a live demo for this talk. I apologize, you'll have to go check it out for yourself. So hopefully, this has given you some encouragement to be able to go out and do this on your own or investigate a bit more, and maybe you will feel comfortable with helping somebody out with this should it happen within your sphere of purview. And the resources for this talk are my pinned tweet. My Twitter is at catpassen, K-A-T-P-A-S-S-E-N. There is a noticed link that has all the slides, quick descriptions of the tools that I went over, and links to all of their sites. Thank you. Hello. Let's see, what does my watch say? My watch says.